acknowledge the traditional owners, the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we're currently meeting and to pay my respects to elders past and present. Well, I don't support women being forced to wear the burqa. I see it as one manifestation of the myriad of ways that uh, women are oppressed in this patriarchal society. I accept that some women choose to wear the burqa, the niqab, the hijab and other head coverings and some do not. For the latter, societal, cultural and religious pressures don't give her a choice. I should add that the same pressures for women to wear ridiculous items of clothing or wear nothing much at all apply to all women in society. Having said that, I want to also make it clear that I do not support a ban on wearing of the burqa. Banning the wearing of a burqa would simply mean that the person that wears it, voluntarily or otherwise, is criminalised. It would not, as some female supporters of the ban argue, help women extricate themselves from patriarchal control over their lives. Rather, I think it would further stigmatise, isolate and remove a tiny number of women in Australia, maybe just a few hundred, from participating in society as women, as workers, as unionists, as feminists, as mothers. Well, supporters of human rights can't evaluate the call to ban the burqa to give the state more power to criminalise its wearing out of its social and political context. The fact is that these calls are coming primarily from the far right in France, in Belgium, in Switzerland, in Italy and in Australia. In this country, the call to ban the burqa has been made by the ultra-conservative Cory Bernardi, committed to supporting Judeo-Christian values, and the ultra-conservative Fred Nile. Neither of these two politicians, as Amanda has also mentioned, are renowned for their progressive views on anything, let alone women's rights. So this should alert us to the real intent behind the call to ban the burqa. It's dog whistling. That is, it's a form of words that purports to mean one thing but has a different or more specific meaning for a targeted subgroup. So while the language purports to be about safety for drivers, for banks, etc., or national security, really, Cory Bernardi and, and uh, Niall are appealing to those who are already fearful of Muslims. Some argue that this is not a racist measure because Islam is not a race. But that is a not too clever attempt to remove the calls to ban from the context in which they come. Racism is the belief that certain races are superior to others. White superiority developed to first justify slavery and then European colonial rule. But today the idea of white racial superiority is so preposterous and so disproved by science and reality that the racists have to try a different tack. Building on fear or concern about Islam is their next best option. So new theories of cultural superiority of the West are used to prop up racial prejudice that exists, but is under challenge. Fred Nile and Cory Bernardi are tapping into the anti-Muslim racism that's been building up for at least a decade. It's been an essential part of the ideology that the two major parties have used to justify Australia's participation in the wars in the Middle East and the need for the so-called war on terror laws. Well, we know that these laws haven't protected anyone from any crime, but they have demonised the Muslim community. They've denied the accused their right to silence, their right to legal representation, the right to stay in contact with their families. And it's also, as an aside, good to hear that Dr Hanif, who's been a victim of these extraordinary laws, is finally pushing for compensation. It's true that not everyone who supports a banning is indeed a racist, but I do believe that such support for such calls does help the racists. But isn't this about women's rights? No. Fred Nile, Cory Bernardi, French President Nicolas Sarkozy, the neo-fascist Northern League in Italy are hardly champions of women's rights. But they all have an interest in distracting increasingly angry people who see their savings and jobs disappear, their services, their pensions and their pay cut in the name of progress. If these politicians were interested in women's rights, wouldn't they be pushing for equal pay? Wouldn't they be pushing for reproductive freedoms? Wouldn't they be pushing for more services for women and equal marriage rights? <laughs> and if these, if these politicians were really interested in stopping women from having to wear the burqa, wouldn't they be stopping, instead of supporting, the 10-year-long war in Afghanistan where women's rights are going from bad to worse? <laughs>
wouldn't they be calling a halt to support for this corrupt Afghan president who's happy to make deals, I might add, with the same fundamentalists who want to force women into wearing burqas? Wouldn't they be jumping up and down about Kazai's support for legalising rape and marriage? But what about those so-called feminists who support the burqa ban? We've all, all heard probably of Virginia Housinger, a columnist um, in Canberra. I believe she's wrong. She's either wittingly or unwittingly assisting the far right in its Islamophobic campaign. And she's loose with the truth when she quotes Islam, uh, uh, Afghan feminist Malala Joya in her defence. Malala Joya, who's recently been in Sydney and spoke at a variety of forums, is not a supporter of the burqa, but she's made it very clear that neither does she support the West bringing in a ban. She says the folk of the West's focus on the burqa is a secondary issue. It's, and she says it serves to trivialise the war against her people, in which women wear the brunt. All right, so what next? Feminists have fought long and hard against the state determining what we should and what we should not wear. Let's not make an exception for a tiny number of people who already have to live in a society where anti-Muslim prejudice is so rife. Self-determination is key. The state can and should do a lot more to assist the acceptance of diversity. Education, the teaching of different languages, real resources into welfare, employment opportunities with equal pay are the key drivers for the emancipation of women. Laws already exist to stop those wanting to physically force or coerce women into wearing burqas. The social, psychological and religious pressures to wear certain things and behave in certain ways certainly does exist. But anyone that thinks that simply passing a law to ban these things that will change uh, life and society is naive. Women's rights in secular and religious households and communities has to be struggled for. And it's only through such struggles, I believe, that people educate themselves and their communities and networks. And it's only then that attitudes begin to change. If we go down the road of banning a burqa, we can expect that next week these ignorant lawmakers will find something else offensive that they'd like to ban. Equal marriage rights, building mosques in certain areas, you name it. Prejudice and discrimination against minorities, which is what this call to ban the burqa is really all about, has devastating consequences. So I would say that those who really do support human rights should not support calls to ban the burqa. Thank you.